Everyone has a story to tell. Welcome to Dingo Talk, where we explore the experiences that make us who we are. Here's your host, Carlo Guadagnino. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is the head football coach at Christopher Newport University, Coach Paul Crowley. Before we get into Coach Crowley's story, we're going to talk about Christopher Newport a little bit. So it's in Newport News, Virginia. They have about 4,449 students. They have an 85% acceptance rate, a 78% graduation rate. It's $33,000 before aid, $25,000 after aid. Their top three majors are business admin and management, psychology, and speech, calm, and rhetoric. Um, and again, as I've told you every week on, along this journey this season, make sure if this is somewhere that you think you want more information about, you talk to the admissions counselors, you talk to your guidance counselor, you talk to your parents, and you can go to the website, cnu.edu. Again, that's cnu.edu. But uh, without further ado, this is Coach Crowley. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is the head football coach at Christopher Newport University, Coach Paul Crowley. Coach, thank you for joining us. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Look forward to talking. Absolutely. Coach, I, I, I have to ask you, uh, the way we do this is we throw you back in the time machine. How did a guy from uh, Midland, Texas, find his way to Newport News, Virginia? Yeah, born in born in Midland. Um, my dad worked in the oil industry, um, as my mom did. So initially lived out there, but moved fairly young into the Virginia Beach area, uh, closer to Newport News. So um heard the stories of, of Texas football and everything that that entails. And then, you know, ended up in Virginia at a fairly young age. Now, coach, why was Christopher Newport where you decided to, to pursue your academics and athletic career? Yeah, I think a, a similar story, a similar sentiment to a lot of D3 guys. Um, you know, I had a, a pretty good high school career on some really good teams, but you know, whether it's an inch too short or a step too, too slow, um, you don't get the scholarship offer maybe you want. So I had to make some hard decisions between walk-ons and division three and seeing you was right up the road and offered a really good education and, you know, high, high caliber of football. Um, before I got there, they had won four championships in a row and nobody had ever done that before. So that was something that intrigued me. I wanted to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Now, coach, after your time, so you spend four years at Christopher Newport, um, what was the transition like for that 09 season where you're no longer in the pads, but you're coaching guys uh, that you played with a year earlier? Yeah, that's something, you know, nowadays I think I have good perspective of talking to some of our younger coaches about, um, you know, initially it was, you know, staying away from the social side of things and, and trying to build a dynamic where you're an authority figure and it's, it's different than um, when you were just playing with them. And I would say probably my second year was even tougher um, cause I played offensive line and, and went to coach receivers. So I was, you know, <laughs> some of these guys probably looking at me like, what does this guy know about receiver play that, uh, he can tell me, but I think as long as you're honest with the kids and, and, you know, your show, you're working to learn your craft, um, and, and you don't lie to them or, or try to pretend you know more than you don't, um, mm -hmm. they'll listen and you get a chance to get better. And so do they. Now coach, it's, you, you, you know, you, you graduate from Christopher Newport, you, spend seven seasons working your way from a GA all the way up to uh, the offensive coordinator. Uh, I'm interested to find out why after the 16 season, and I think I have an idea, why was it time to spread your wings a little bit? Um, and let me ask it this way. Did it had something to do with the job being a division one job? Uh, y yes and no. Um, you know, the, the advice I got, early on in coaching for one of my mentors was to move around as much as you can when you're young and you don't have a family and, you know, you can, you can make it work for less money. And I, I guess I didn't take that advice very well staying at CNU, but um, I was fortunate. I think I did a good job in the role that I was in and uh, coach Kelchner, you know, constantly was promoting me. So the job always felt new and fresh. I didn't feel like I was getting stale. Um, but then, you know, coach Kelchner retired there in 2016 and um, you know, I'd been the offensive coordinator and, I uh, really enjoyed that aspect of it and new staff came in and, uh, you know, obviously there's going to be changes and I was kept on staff, but maybe not in the role that I wanted. And just so happened at the same time, William Mary came open and coach Laycock and the, the rich tradition of coaches that have come through William and Mary was kind of a no brainer. 
Now, the first year at William and Mary was a little was a little rocky. The second year, I noticed when I went back and looked, um, there was a big win over Maine. There was a win over Villanova. So it looked like the second year, you guys were really starting to gain some ground. Yeah, from from my understanding, for some of the coaches that have been there a, a long time, you know, at a high academic school like William Mary, you kind of go in cycles. Yeah. Um, so they had had a couple good years before I got there. You know, um, beating JMU and doing some of those other things. So. Um, the first year was rough, but, um, you know, I think it's, it goes to show you, you can be the smartest coaches in the world, but you better have talented players. You know, that offensive right. staff we had has two division one coordinators and an NFL head coach and myself. And, you know, we could barely score 14 points a game or whatever it was. So you, you better have, you know, good football players and be on the same page as coaches. Right. So then after that second season, uh, we right back, right back jaunt over to Christopher Newport why was it time to return and and how did that prepare you for this role that you're in now as the head coach um it was big that so coach Laycock retired there at William and Mary after my two seasons um and he had been there 39 years for those that don't know um so you know second time in a three-year period where you know head coach I felt I had a good relationship retired and you know I kind of had to find a new deal Mm -hmm. um and was fortunate enough that seeing you was right down the road and and had an opening. Um, but I would say what I learned from it was it was a bit of a humbling experience. You know, the rest of the staff at William and Mary uh, were able to find other jobs quicker. And, you know, most of those at the division one level or above. So um, it was a bit of humble pie to go back, you know, down to where I'd been before. Um, but you, you realize football is football. And um, mm-hmm. if you're happy in the job you're in, uh, you can have a lot of fun. And we didn't have success that year. I first came back, but I was coaching offensive line again. And there was just something to the brotherhood of coaching offensive line that I realized I had really missed. And even right. despite not having a great, uh, the most talented group, they were a really fun group to work with. Um, so, you know, it kind of took me back to the roots of why I was doing it, I think. Now, coach, I'm going to, I want to ask this and I want to make sure I ask it the right way. Um, is there more, is there a little bit more for you now being the head coach at CNU being that you're an alum and that you've spent most of your coaching career, you know, working your way up the ladder there? Is there a little bit more, uh, I don't know how, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but yeah, um, does it mean more to you? Yeah. I mean, I think naturally it always is not that for, you know, coaches coaching at their non alma mater that they don't care, but, for me, it's, it's CNU is a fairly young program. So other than the first four years, I wasn't there. Um, Mm -hmm. I know most every alumni associated with it. Um, so that's a really cool aspect is, is seeing the growth and maturity of those guys over the years and what they're doing now and really just growing and molding people, which initially was not the reason I got into coaching. I just wanted to be around football. Um, but I think coaching at your own mater, it's it's an even cooler side effect to see that growth and change in young men. Now, Coach, before we jump into the 2023 season, um, to recap it and then talk about the 2024 season, um, put us in the room as a fly on the wall when you're talking to a prospective player and and his parents, uh, minus the fact the guy's got to be able to play. What are you looking for and what are you telling the the parents there um, to kind of give them the comfort of knowing, you know, for the next four years, we're going to take care of your son and he's going to come out better than he was when he when he got here? Yeah, I would say to the first first part of that question, um, it's ensuring the parents of stability, you know, mm-hmm. particularly in Division two, Division three football is a lot of places that aren't very stable, whether it's the university itself or whether it's the football program. Um, but, you know, it's a place I want to be for a long time as an alumni. And I purposely made the made the choice to hire coaches I thought would stay for a while. Not that if they didn't get a great opportunity, they wouldn't take it, but. Um, I wanted guys that could stay somewhere four years and develop the kids over that course of four years and not constantly have change and influx. Um, And, you know, that's really my sell to the parents is we're going to take care of them and grow and mature them. And as far as to what we're looking for, I think first and foremost, any level of football, I don't care if it's the NFL, um, you want to find guys that love the game. Right. Um, And everyone will say that it's easier said than done figuring out if if a kid really does love it or not. Um, but typically that's the first quality we're looking for. Then um, I've always felt it was a, it's disingenuous to say, I'm going to change the culture of a team or I'm going to change the character of the team. 
To a degree you can, but I think the the bigger aspect you better do is, is find the right character kids in the first place in the recruiting process. So mm -hmm. uh, we spend a lot of time getting into the weeds on that. On basically, are they good people that I want to be around every day for four years? And then for those that aren't familiar, you know, we've talked, we're, we're talking about Christopher Newport. Talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, for those that have never been to Christopher Newport or, or give us a little bit about the, the university and the, and Newport news, Virginia. Yeah. So it's, it's a fairly unique uh, college story, um, university story. So we're in Newport news, which is in Hampton roads area, about, you know, 45 minutes from Virginia beach, not far from Williamsburg either. Um, so we're in a nice, you know, city area. Um, and for a long time, we were a commuter branch to the College of William and Mary. Um, so a small commuter school. Uh, and really in 1996, we brought in a new president that had run for governor of Virginia, been in the U.S. Senate. Um, and he went, he felt like he wanted to build a, a public university that felt like a private school, but was still at a public school cost. So um, he used those connections for for many, many years to build the place into what it is now, you know, literally, I think $2 billion in the last 20 years on the campus itself. So um, as you know, the campus got nicer and the school grew to where almost 5,000 students now, the academics went up uh, pretty quickly as well. So now we're a really high academic um, public university and we feel like we got a lot to offer. Now, uh, coach, the, let's talk about the 2023 season. So you guys are coming off the NJAC championship. You and your coaching staff were coach and coaching staff of the year. Um, it's the first team since the 2014 team to make the playoffs seven and four overall five and one in the conference. And the first, first round exit to Randolph Macon. And it, and it, it from, from what, going back and watching the replay, a couple, if you had maybe three more minutes, that game could have been a little different. Um, so talk to us about the 2023 season and what you felt uh, just to, to recap it and and your thoughts on it now that the dust has settled. Yeah, I think it's it's always interesting to look back and, um, you know, we're in the process of probably watching our film for a third time. And every time you watch it, you see something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say the biggest thing going into the season was we had some success that first season um, that I took over and, and wanted to make sure the kids didn't get complacent after one good season. So that was kind of the big um big point in the off season. And then I'll just say they were a really fun, fun uh, group of kids to coach. Mm -hmm. And we had the rare, you know, rare big group of fifth year seniors because of COVID. So there were a lot of kids I'd been around for a long time and they meant a lot to me, um, particularly some of the offensive linemen I'd coached. So seeing those guys through and, and making sure that they could leave seeing you um, with the championships that, you know, a lot of the teams and players of the past had was really, really important to me. So as the season went on um, and, you know, the games became more and more important all the way, including the uh, TC and J game that was close right there at the end to win the conference. Um, it was more so just wanting to have another week with those guys to right. be able to joke around with them and have fun at practice and, you know, travel and all that that entails. And then, yeah, in the playoffs, you know, um, wish we would have played a little bit better in that game. But, um, you know, our kids played hard and kind of see where they need to get to to take that next step. Right. So now looking forward to the uh, 2024 season, the non-conference schedule is trying uh, Johns Hopkins and Gettysburg. And before we get into the 2024 season, my question for you is with having to schedule three non-conference games, do you find that it's ever difficult for, because I know week one is kind of easy and then it becomes a problem with week two and then specifically that third week is when a lot of conferences are starting their conference play. Yep. And um, I took over some of the scheduling had already been done previously by our athletic director. So that made it easier on me, but I heard the horror stories of trying to find these non-conference games, particularly later in the year um, mm -hmm. as it goes on. So actually when I first took over the NJAC had come to a scheduling agreement um, um with the uh, blanket on the name of the conference right now in the interview, but with the, the league that has Johns Hopkins and Gettysburg, the Centennial, excuse me. Centennial. Yep. Um, yep. So we had, we had had the schedule agreement with the Centennial to play three games, um, which everyone was in favor of because it made it so that, you know, you didn't have to search as hard. Um, we had had Southern Virginia on a two year schedule and um, that fell through. And I kind of learned about um, that, you know, some of these schedulings can be gotten out of fairly easily. Um, so that's, that's, 
and, and it happened a little later in the game. So that was my first, you know, real foray into how hard it is. And I was lucky enough, Trine had a game dropped as well. And, um, you know, we figured out the financials of, of going out to Indiana and, you know, getting our kids to experience something new um, and, and play against a new opponent that we, you know, don't know a whole lot about. Now, other than the non-conference schedule, what are you? What are your thoughts and feelings as we're we're getting closer to camp? We're getting we're out of spring ball. The semesters are over. What What are you thinking about going into camp and in in looking forward to the twenty twenty four season? Yeah, I think as, as a head coach, you're always trying to weigh um, pushing your guys while keeping them healthy at the same time. I think that's the the fine line everybody's trying to tell, and I don't know that everybody anybody has the perfect answer. So. Um, that's typically on my mind a lot. And then, you know, making sure our freshmen are as ready to go as they can possibly be when camp comes and then making sure our upperclassmen are hungry. And, you know, we have a, a big group staying on campus, which is huge for us where they get to, you know, work out with our strength and conditioning coach and, uh, we can kind of keep eyes on them a little bit. And then coach, there's a lot of changes coming 2024. Uh, there's two in particular that I want to talk about. Um, the first one being the expansion of the playoffs from 32 to 40, obviously, the 29 AQs kind of makes it interesting when you when you were looking at the 32 number. Do you feel that it was uh, it was the right time to expand the playoffs and was 40 the right number? Um, I'll probably leave that question to the experts, which I'm not on that. I've always just kind of been of the opinion for a long time. You win your conference, you go to the playoffs. Right. Um, but what I will say is, again, with that Centennial Conference crossover film, um, I know Muhlenberg missed out on the playoffs and they were nine and one and just barely, you know, could have beat Johns Hopkins in that game. So, you know, I think a team like that, just, you know, not knowing a whole lot about them, but watching them on film, I thought they were deserving to be in that tournament and, and have a chance to go on a run. So I think the more teams that are in within reason, you know, the better for the sport. And then the other big news that came out the same day that uh, we got the expansion to the playoffs was the addition um, of the possibility of, Teams having 18 iPads on the sideline with them. Um, I guess high schools are doing it. The NFL does it. It's trickled its way down to Division Three. Where do you fall on that? And is that something you guys are going to utilize this season? Yeah, that's for sure something we're going to utilize. Um, I think in a lot of ways it's a game changer. You know, um, mm -hmm. I've spent years and years coming to the sideline asking the offensive line or the quarterback what happened. And, you know, it's kind of like a crime. You get four different stories on what happened and none of them are the truth. Um, so, you know, being able to go and, and check your iPad and see exactly what happened and make your adjustments, um, I think will probably make the game cleaner on both sides. So, you know, it's something going through for the first time will be interesting. But, you know, we've got a coach on our staff that coached at the high school level and has done it already. So mm -hmm. having that experience and be able to work through some of the kinks already, um, I think will be important for us. And then do you think specifically on the iPads being added to the sideline, does that inevitably trickle down replay to Division Three? I would imagine having, you know, spent a pretty extensive amount of time looking at the different re the different um, sideline systems we use. It's it's a pretty logical step that that could come next. Um, you know, I was kind of shocked at how simple and easy some of the systems were, to be perfectly honest, that it seems, you know, even for somebody who's not a technological expert like myself, um, it, it seems pretty straightforward. So I would imagine down the line that could be um, something we certainly look at. You know, I think the equity and being able to do it at all places maybe that don't have the same um funding as other schools you know that'll be probably the hiccup yeah now and i guess that's the i guess that's the only hang up right is are we going to do this like we do the headsets where if you go to let's say a saint vincent a bethany college somewhere like that and they're not using them do do both teams just decide okay we're not using them then or does the team that invested in it and has been using it do they still get to i know that that's some of the things that need to be ironed out of of this whole um, I mean, and obviously technology is not going anywhere. It's only going to get better. So, um, yeah, I think I think you better adjust to it. And, um, you know, they're going through similar things at the Division One level. I still have some buddies at William & Mary, um, and they're going to play, I think, UVA, but one of the Division One teams that has the headsets, um, you know, in the quarterback's ear. And mm -hmm. they don't have that, but they have access to use it if they want to in the Division One matchup. But, you know, it doesn't make sense financially to do all that. So then the Division One team has an advantage there. So I think all those kind of little nuances of equity will, will have to get hammered out. And then, Coach, what for you as a Division Three guy, what would you say the significance of Division Three and Division Three athletics are to, you know, student athletes? Yeah, I mean, I think – 
the um you know the cliche answer is it's the purest form of the sport and you know guys are doing it for the love of it um but i i just think more and more football as a whole um at any level you know it, it is the best um approximation of what life's going to be you know you, you get challenges you get your ups and downs um you're forced to deal with adversity you know a lot um and i think as a college student athlete that's even greater so um, I think it's a it's a great training ground for for, you know, good employees, but also just good people um, in our country, which, you know, I think is always a good thing. So to me, that's, you know, college athletics in general, but particularly at the D3 level, um, what it's all about. And then, um, Coach, so we've come to I ask five random questions. They have they don't really have to do necessarily with football. They might. Um, okay. But we're going to hit you with them. There's the last two questions are two parts. So. Um, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, plenty of places I'd love to see. Cause you never, as a, as a football coach really get to travel. Um, I don't know about live there, but I'd like to go to Europe one day. I'd like to go to Japan and see all these other places. But if it was just retiring, it's probably on a beach somewhere. You, you pick the tropical paradise, Hawaii, Fiji, whatever. Right. Right. Um, what what is the most important lesson that you've learned over your career? Ooh. A lot of different things to go through there. Most important lesson. Um, I would say I learned from the guy that was my position coach um, when I played, who I was fortunate to coach with for a long time and then hire back when I was the head coach. Um, and, and it was a lesson he never explicitly taught me. Um, but something, you know, that that stood out to me was he always treated the young guy, maybe the guy that's not making as much, maybe the guy that wasn't a great football player, the exact same that he would treat, you know, if he met the head coach of the University of Alabama. Right. Um, so I think from a young age, you know, I'd already had that instilled in me and my, by my parents, but just treating people all the same, um, regardless mm -hmm. of the position there, and I think it's incredibly important um, for anybody. And coach, you touched on. I'm I'm throwing this one in there because I, I it's been it keeps popping back into my head. You touched on after your second the start of your second season, where as an offensive lineman by trade, you you start coaching the wide receivers. Um, what was that like as a big teaching the skill guys? Yeah, the and I've been fortunate enough now. I've coached running backs quarter. I've really coached it all on offense. Um, to where football is football, you know, right. at some points it's about leverage. It's about angles. There's a lot of crossover. Um, but I'd say the biggest change up is just being confident in yourself. You know, mm -hmm. I'd studied, you know, I remember the first one I studied was the complete wide receiver with urban Meyer from 1995 at Notre Dame or whatever. And you watch all this stuff, but you're not as confident in it because you, you never actually done it yourself. So I think early on, it was important to admit when I didn't know something to those guys, um, and then we were fortunate to have really good receivers in my time there. So I kind of learned as an offensive guy, just, you know, you better get the ball to your best players. You know, I would get frustrated as a coach when, when our receiver wasn't getting the ball in the first half. So I've kind of tried to remind myself of that, you know, through the course of my career when maybe I'm not coaching the receivers. Right. Uh, if you weren't coaching, what would you be doing? Ooh, one of two things as a kid, I wanted to be a policeman for a long time. Um, but the other thing I wanted to do was maybe be like a tornado chaser. So, um, I don't know how, I don't know how lucrative that would be. I don't know if, uh, that was cause twisters can or twister came out, when I was <laughs> kid, I know, but that, that was the dream then. So I'd probably be doing something like that. Something completely weird and arbitrary. Now, coach, I got to tell you, that's not the, uh, that's not the most outrageous one we've heard. I, a couple weeks ago, I had somebody tell me they, 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 and their brother, had talked extensively about being garlic farmers. Yeah, um, I didn't even know garlic came from farms, so that's. A... I did not either. So I, I, we all learned something that day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Coach, what's the best compliment that you've ever received? Hmm. Best compliment I've ever received. Uh in the context, you know, in the it was a pretty cool one this past year. Um. A kid I had coached um, when I was the offensive coordinator, he was our quarterback and he split time and he was never really the guy. And 
I always felt like our relationship was a little testy and we both had similar kind of standoffish personalities at times. Um, wasn't a bad relationship, but it wasn't great. Mm -hmm. um, he came back and talked to our guys and just, you know, reiterated that, you know, it doesn't seem like it now, but everything your coaches are telling you, they're telling you for a reason and it'll make more sense to you when you're my age and and then seeing this kid mature and grow um, and, and, you know, seeing him just being a completely different human being was pretty cool. And, you know, him thanking me for everything I did was, you know, it's not something he had to do, but it, it certainly felt like a compliment. Right. And then the other side of compliments, what's the best insult you've ever received? Oh, well, at, at, I've been at way the, the, the coaching at William Mary, uh, was very, uh, it was tough coaching. So, you know, I think anybody that's been through there would tell you that they've been, they've been quote unquote fired a million times. So that was, you know, something that was brought up at halftime of games and those kind of things. So threatening to be fired and that kind of thing, uh, as a coach is, is one of the rougher ones probably. Uh, side question, where did you meet your wife? I met her when I was working at William and Mary. Um, oh, and, so um, it all, yeah, it all worked out. Um, she was working as a speech pathologist and, and you know, met her out one night and hit it off and was lucky enough that she knew absolutely nothing about football, but she was a quick learner and kind of realized, you know, what it would entail possibly marrying to a coach and, you know, you know, one kid later, um, still going strong. And I think she understands it. And there we got to we got to make sure we mention this. The 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 coaches' wives are the are are the true soldiers, right? Because they they got to they're there during the season, they're there after the season, they're there for the long nights and the and the shorts. So I don't think the the wives don't get enough credit. So we're going to start doing that as well. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I was just going to say we um, had our first kid about a month before, or actually I should say about two weeks before camp started. My first year as a head coach. Ooh. Um, so that was quite a lot going <laughs> on and she, she handled it incredibly well. Well, congratulations on, on, on the birth of your child now would be going on two, right? Uh, uh, two years old. Yeah, he's going on two. And then we, we, we're expecting a second one right around, uh, right around the season. So it's going to be interesting again. Well, congratulations on that. Best of luck yeah. to, to both of you. Uh, coach, the last question we've asked everybody this question, uh, was there something that you were expecting to be asked today and if so how would you have answered it oh expecting to be asked um i don't know i was ex you know i thought maybe you'd have questions about specific teams so i was in my mind trying to come up with the the non-answer uh answers that i could come up with because we play a really really tough schedule so you know we always want to make sure we don't give any fuel to the fire for any of those teams we're playing against right um, well, Coach, I want to say thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with us. Uh, for those of you that are sticking around, we have Christopher Newport's highlight tape from last season that you'll be seeing. Uh, this has been Coach Paul Crowley, the head football coach of Christopher Newport University. And we'll be right back. Chuckleheads. Thanks for checking out this episode of Dingo Talk. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. For more info and to contact the show, you can find us on Twitter at Dingo Talk.